We are going to look at a slightly different perspective, but one which I think is a really critical one here. It's about the opportunities and challenges of artificial intelligence, but from an investor's perspective. So I am very excited to welcome to the stage one of the industry's most sought after AI investors, Lonnie Jaffe, Managing Director at Insight Partners. Lonnie is going to walk us through the importance of explainability, here it is again, the promise of next-gen MLOps stacks, and that investor's point of view on why the scale-up of AI is happening right now. Please welcome to the stage, Lonnie Jaffe. Thank you, Nikki, and uh, thank you all for coming. Great to be here. Um, so. I'm going to uh, talk through just a little bit of what we've noticed as an investor. I've, I've been at Insight about five years now, and we've invested in a couple of dozen somewhat scale machine learning portfolio companies, some at the infrastructure layer, um, and then some that are applied machine learning to specific industry use cases like healthcare or fintech. And I'm going to talk about um, the perspective that we've gotten on what kind of challenges they're struggling with. My background, so I, I've been in Insight for about five years. I was at uh, an Insight portfolio company. I was CEO of a data infrastructure software business before that. It's now called Precisely. It used to be called Syncsort. And I was at IBM for about 13 years before that. So one of the, um, Insight's been investing in software for over 20 years or so. And, and we, um, you know, people had compilers and there's like no code software, but in general, people used to show up at work every day and write all the software. And one of the things that's been happening recently is that machines are writing some of the software. So people don't call it machines writing software, they call it machine learning models being trained. Um, but data comes in and then software comes out. And the software can do things like make predictions or recommendations or classifications. There's these really interesting generative models like GPT-3, the large language models that can generate text. Uh, we saw the virtual Nikki that, you know, uh, from hour one that are able to generate virtual avatars. And the decline in price associated with all of these tasks, many of which are extremely core to certain industries, causes some things to be, which are economic substitutes, to go down in value, and then a lot of things that are economic complements to go significantly up in value. The um, array of things that you can do with this software that gets written by machines is actually quite varied. Um, this uh, list, many of which are from our portfolio companies, of things that you can do with AI systems could be 100 pages long, right? And we still wouldn't capture the stuff that's in production today in various, uh, various real, real world scenarios. And so I'm just going to, in order to sort of wrap our minds around this, talk you through a very oversimplified three layer framework that's kind of a way of thinking about the different kinds of companies we're seeing. So the first layer, layer one, these are the companies that they're not building AI systems, they're building software that you can use to build an AI system with, right? So these are workbenches and frameworks and toolkits and modular components of various kinds. Um, they're dealing with specific kinds of challenges, some of which we've already heard about today. And uh, as one example, if you look at MLOps, uh, Sophie, who's in the audience today from Insight, is ma maintaining this map of some of the modular components that we're seeing uh, whole arrays of scale-ups emerge to focus on. And um, this is, I think of that this is more as like a subway map. Not, it's not intended to be super accurate. It's supposed to be exaggerated um, to show areas where you see a lot of real world scale ups. And, and as a technology growth investor, the world does a lot of the work for us of sort of figuring out what are interesting spaces by virtue of scale ups starting to exist in those spaces. And you know, just as an example, um, something like weights and biases, right? The, the, uh, the, they're the leader in experiment tracking, hyperparameter optimization, a few other modular components. This stack is turning out to be more different from the traditional data analytics stack than we might have expected a priori. Now, that may change over time. There could be convergence. We heard a little bit about that from Databricks. Um, but so far, not only is that happening, but there's even a divergence happening between the MLF stack for unstructured and structured data. So you see, um, you see companies like, um, like Overjet, which can you know, tell you whether you need a crown or a filling based on a, uh, a reading a dental x-ray, which is an image recognition task, will use a very different MLOps stack than, say, Zest AI, which is looking at uh, tabular data for the purposes of deciding whether or not you should, uh, it, a given person should get a loan, right? So that's a much more structured data use case. Uh, not completely different, but relatively different MLOps stack, and that's actually diverging over time. Um, explainability and causality, we've heard a lot about today. Um, there are some use cases like email spam filtering, where it's totally fine to not be able to explain why you made a prediction. There's other use cases where it's not fine. Um, and if you need to be able to engender trust with users, 
if you're a regulator and you need to be able to audit or certify things, if you just want to test it so that it will behave like reliable software, um, or you want it to be able to interact well with humans, then explainability is very useful. Humans are pretty good at causality compared to machines. Like we see that airline prices are higher when the occupancy rate is higher, and we immediately know that the occupancy rate causes the airline prices to be higher. A machine learning system is not good at noticing that. Um, we need better ways to teach the machines what we know about causality. Um, we also make mistakes. Humans see causality when it doesn't exist very frequently. Um, but this is a very early area of, I mean, mostly the way we teach machines our causality understanding today is through the design of the machine learning systems. Um, privacy and security, very important. Um, I'll just highlight one example of an innovative technology that started to emerge here, which is the secure enclave technologies. So for a while, there were, um, there were, uh, so the, the, the hyperscale vendors have built out a lot of hardware that's made it, uh, that are basically these special secure enclaves. You can have the data come in encrypted, do machine learning on it in the encrypted environment, never see the source data, get the insights. Um, and now they have a huge amount of hardware out there and there's technologies like Anjuna security that are making it really easy to build apps that leverage the secure enclave technology. Um, but we also heard about the attack services increasing and there's a lot of AI based attacks that are starting to happen. Operationalizing the systems is also becoming increasingly important at the infrastructure layer. Um, uh, there's a, a lot that needs to happen at the edge. So if you think about, like, if you talk into your phone and you do voice to text, there's the version that comes up initially, which is kind of like OK as a voice to text, and then it syncs with the cloud and it gets a little bit better. That kind of architecture is very hard to build. Um, it requires inference at the edge, inference in central command. You need to do some training in central locations. You need to do pre-processing at the edge and then send only partially synthesized data. Most database infrastructures are not designed for that kind of environment. Um, there are really interesting technologies like our portfolio company, Desi AI, that can, you put in the data, the models, and the hardware you're going to be running it against, and it'll find a different models that will perform accuracy-wise very similarly, but much better on that hardware. But this is still very early days. Um, and data gravity is becoming more of a problem over time versus less. It's a little bit of a misconception, but actually data volumes and data densities are increasing faster than network bandwidth. So it's actually becoming more of an issue, not less. And then most of the machine learning systems are still just displaying information to humans. But um, what you actually want in an ideal world is when they get accurate enough, they can just do things. Automatically quarantine a machine um, if you notice that it's being hit with mal malware. Um, optim use a solver type technology uh, to do optimization like routing or pricing. Um, or just be coupled with real software that can take action. Or maybe even use some of the generative models like generate text or video in response to a prediction. So then the next layer, layer two, this is where we've been the most active. So these are companies where the product is software powered by AI. So cybersecurity is a great example. These businesses can be amazing, right? If you're Sentinel-1 and you go to a hospital and you say, hey, why don't you let me have access to all of your cybersecurity data so I can protect you, the hospital is not going to say, oh, no, 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 that's proprietary data. I want to do this myself. I want to build my own cybersecurity system, right? That's the last thing they want to do. They just want to be using the thing that's getting better the most quickly. So if you can build the leader in the space, you can get these really nice um, kind of multi-decade insurmountable advantages. The, um, the space itself, you know, I'd say in general, the companies tend to start out very services intensive, you know, humans pretending to be AI systems, or as one of my friends says, services as a software. And then over, over time, they start to um, make predictions and display information to humans. And then at some point, they get accurate enough that they can make some decisions on their own and only display exceptions to humans so that they can get advice. And then at some point, there's like the elevator moment, right? There used to be the people with the sticks in the elevator, right? And now, at, um, if you saw a person with a stick in the elevator, you'd be a little concerned. Um, because the, the machine learning systems can get so good, the superhuman performance, that you wouldn't want to let the humans touch it. Different kinds of data. Training data is probably the most widely talked about. But there's also inference data and feedback data. These are also very important. Um, uh, feedback data, like if you do Google search and you get the search result and you click on the, one of the results, that tuning system is something that you get only from having a live operational system. In many cases, though, um, I think there's a, a little bit of a misconception that data scale effects are always there in an AI product, but in many cases, they're very weak. So you don't get any comparative advantage. You might still want to use it, but it doesn't, it's not a source of differentiation. It's like having a uh, UI in your product. Um, you can have diminishing returns to marginal data, or maybe the data is just very easy to get, um, or the accuracy improvements are not that important. Um, but when they work, they're pretty magical. And um, we're seeing a couple of things that are a little surprising. Like one is that the AI infrastructure 
is way more important than we would have thought as a source of differentiation if you can make it very scalable. So we have a portfolio company, Run AI, that lets you run um, really efficiently on GPUs. It's like VMware for GPUs. And uh, companies at the layer two that use this type of tech can make their product not just cheaper, but qualitatively different and better. Like our one is, is able to allow you to uh, play around with the avatars and then and not charge you for every little iteration that you do so that when you only pay for it when you actually get the final product. Um, whereas a lot of the competition uh, has to charge you as they go because the infrastructure is not as efficient. And there's really interesting technology around uh, tactics to lower data costs. Great stuff coming out of the research labs in academia, some of the large consumer internet companies like Meta AI and Google Research around self-supervised learning where you, you take the images and you remove pieces of the images and then you fill them in using predictions and you can get much larger data sets um, that are actually much less biased uh, to do, do training and certain types of active learning techniques whereby you can, the machine learning systems themselves can learn what type of additional data they might need and then ask for it, either ask humans or, or do things in order to get access to it. Like, uh, like Waze can send you into traffic um, in, in order to see whether the traffic is still there. I'm just kidding about that. Um, AI technical talent is looking for a slightly different type of um, culture than you would normally see in a software engineering organization. They're looking for it to be a little bit more academic-like, so they want to be able to publish. They want to be able to spend time learning about academic material and catching that information as it comes in. But like any software engineering organization, they're looking for really high growth environments. They want economic upside. They want mission-oriented use cases. You know, healthcare is really easy. It's a little bit harder when you're dealing with like infrastructure software, but um, it can still be done. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll sort of close out around the third layer. So this is where things get really interesting. So this is the captive AI layer, where the AI is core to the industry. So think about like going to a, a bank and saying, we have a loan origination uh, AI system. And the bank is not going to just give you all their loan data and say, we're going to outsource this to you, because that's what they are. Like, What else are they going to be? Just a, a hollow shell that manages customer relationships? So people try to do it themselves, you know, hire machine learning people, and, and build their own systems. But um, they're not always able to. Sometimes they don't have investors who are willing to let them invest over long-term time horizons. Sometimes they're not able to attract and retain the kind of talent that they need. Sometimes the shape of the firm needs to change um, because of the existence of AI. Um, companies are learning systems, humans are learning systems. And so if the core learning system of an organization is now powered by AI, a new scale up might emerge. And we're starting to see this more and more. We've been investing in some, like our portfolio company, Pros, which is uh, making hair products. It has powerful AI technology, but they, they don't sell it to hair companies they, or hair product companies. They, they just became one. Right? So they, they make their own shampoo, and then they deliver it direct to consumers. The core DNA of the firm is still this AI capability. And you see this a little bit with Netflix and entertainment and Amazon and retail. The shape of the firm can change. They can sort of go, and Netflix might go into original programming, or Amazon might go into last mile delivery in order to capture more data or leverage the data that they have. So it's like starting with a white sheet of paper. Imagine that AI works, because now it does. Um, what should the shape of a firm be? And maybe it's not the same shape. And from an investor perspective, maybe you're fine with the existing companies kind of gracefully winding themselves down and recycling. And you, know, you invest in another part of your portfolio in a high growth scale up through Insight Partners. And so we're seeing more and more of this at the captive AI level where the industry itself is becoming reimagined. So that's pretty interesting. And then as we look to 2022, um, I think one thing um, that's been pretty interesting is watching the valuations. Um, right now, I'd say they're very indexed to the pace and durability of the growth. So it's not just um, like how fast you're growing, but also the quality of the revenue growth. High gross retention rates, high net retention rates, lots of net new revenue being added. Predictive accuracy improving over time. So you want to see that the, the, marginal, uh, the data itself is not diminishing marginal returns. And, and those companies are getting rewarded. And you start to see um, you know, pretty healthy valuations. They went up a lot last year. They've come down a little bit more recently. Um, but the companies that are still getting really, really nice valuations um, have that sustainable growth. Um, you're seeing new interesting models of human collaboration with superhuman AI. And then I would say one thing we noticed during the pandemic was that there were, um, there were a lot of collaboration software companies where you just saw like huge fixed costs that people were not making that all of a sudden they made. And then when the pandemic was over, like they didn't unplug all their investments in, uh, in remote collaboration technology. And I think with the uptick of inflation, you may start to see a similar phenomenon with some of these automation capabilities that AI unlocks, which is that 
Um, one way we can solve some of the shortages in labor and, um, and objects that we have is to intentionally slow down the economy in order to let some steam out of the system. But, um, but another way you could potentially do it is to dramatically improve productivity, right? So to, to pull forward investments and automation that you otherwise would have made many years into the future and to do it now. And so it may be that AI is in some ways the unsung hero of, uh, of some of the, the recent crises that we've been dealing with. So with that, enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lonnie.